morning. I am Fritzo and I'm a senior underwriter within the PI team. And I'll be joined today by Richard Hall, who's um, from Pot Seeds, who, who's going to be talking to us um, about contracts and the importance of um, limitation of liability within um, the PI space. And I'll just start with a brief uh, PI product overview, and um, we'll take it from there. Thanks, everyone. OK. So what is professional indemnity insurance? It's a third party legal liability policy, meaning that the policy is triggered once a third party has suffered some sort of damages, whether financial or the advice has caused them some harm. Um, so that is why it's called a third party legal li liability policy. Um, it's designed or tailored um, for business owners, freelancers, and, and anyone who's self-employed from any claims arising from third parties for any errors and omissions. Um, some of the professions that we currently do right are accountants, attorneys, IT consultants, um, travel agents, engineers, quantity surveyors, and land surveyors, estate agents, actuaries, and anyone who renders advice for a fee. And what we mean there is that anyone who actually provides a professional service and can be sued for the advice that they give, but they must charge a fee for that um, advice. And we have been approached in various occasions by your the likes of your plumbers, the, the likes of your electricians, who are not necessarily um, professionals in their field, but they do render a professional service. Generally, for those um, type of uh, risks, we refer them to our GL team um, for cover for defective works, because in most instances for, for those type of professionals, you'll find that the claims will arise from defective workmanship um, rather than errors and omissions. So um, we do kind of classify, you know, the type of professions that we can write. And And again, the list of professions is endless. It's not only limited to what you see here. Um, that is why we say anyone who renders advice for a fee can actually obtain a professional um, indemnity policy. So the trigger to our policy would be any actual or alleged negligence in the course of the professional um, performing their duties, um, which might cause any harm or damage to the third party. Um, the cause would generally be any negligent acts, errors and omissions while they are conducting their professional duties and where they could actually make errors, misjudgment and, and any misrepresentation. And the cover, again, it's any liability flowing from third parties, from any services that have been provided by the professional. It can either be direct or indirect, and um, we cover the legal defense costs of the third party, as well as any damages awarded to them. And we also look at covering the insured's own legal defense costs. We cover investigation costs, which would be um, costs of appointing a loss adjuster or an attorney on the matter. Um, we also would then cover um, any other costs that um, the third party may be awarded in the event that there is a claim against our professional. So um, the limit of indemnity, how it operates, it's generally um, VET. So we show it as VET exclusive on the schedule, but our limit of indemnities are VET inclusive. So we do book the VET um, behind the scenes or on the system, but our limits do include the VET as well. The limits are cost inclusive. So what we mean by that is that anything relating to the claim will be paid from the limit of indemnity. And I will talk to you on the next slides as to how do you gauge how much is enough for the client? Um, because everything that is relating to the claim will be paid out of the limit of indemnity that the client is purchasing from us. There will always be um, an excess or a deductible. So that would be the first amount that is payable by the insured in, in respect of any claim. And um, we generally do set minimum deductibles per um, the, 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 the various sectors based on um, you know, the, higher, the higher the risk sector, of course, the deductible will be higher than um, all the other sectors. So we generally do set the minimum deductibles. And um, you know, the higher the deductible that the client purchases, you know, the bigger the premium discount or the premium savings that they stand to get from our quotes. So that's um, what's important there. 
So again, how much is enough? Um, so we look at you know the nature and complexity of the work that the the the, the professional performs. I mean, um, if you look at engineers, they are generally appointed in various projects, and therefore purchasing 1 million rands of cover might not be enough because they have um, you know, a large exposure to third party claims and they could be sued in within the period of insurance, they could be sued by uh, multiple third parties. So that's one thing um, to consider when you are advising your clients as to how much they need to purchase for their business. Again, we cannot give um, any advice relating to the limit of indemnities um, that they should purchase, but we generally do um, you know, tend to guide um, our, our, our brokers as to um, what they should look at because as we've estimated or as we've seen um, basically 20 to 25 percent of the limit is allocated to legal and investigation costs so that's a big chunk of the limit of indemnity um, and then there's not always enough left for any damages that might be um, awarded to the third party. So we always um, make sure that the, 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 the broker advises their client to purchase the highest affordable limit with the higher, highest affordable access to their client. I did see a hand. Um, is there a question? I think it was put down, Fiso. Okay, cool. But um, you can pop it on the chat box as well and um, we'll um, answer it as well as we go along. Okay, so that is um, uh, what we look at in terms of determining how much is enough in terms of limit of indemnity. Again, contractual limitation of liability also um, plays a part in this, and Richard will be taking us through that as well. So some of the added benefits to our cover that are standard at no additional costs would be your breach of copyright or intellectual property. So the importance there is that we are not covering the actual copyright or the intellectual property, but any unintentional breach of these would be picked up under the PI policy. We're covering any cost of fee recovery, defamation, mitigation loss, costs, subconsultants, we do find that um, generally in the built environment, engineers and the likes would subcontract some of their duties in a project, and therefore um, we do extend to cover um, the liability arising from the subconsultant, but we do insist that rights of recourse against the subconsultant is always um, maintained by the insured. Um, any wrongful arrest, Public liability, we do give um, 1 million in the aggregate of public liability free of charge, um, just so that the client has comfort that they do have some form of public liability extended to them. However, if they do um, look are looking for higher um, limits on the public liability and other um, covers that might be um, afforded under the broad form liability, we do refer them to our broad form liability team for those um, added benefits. Again, we'll cover legal defense costs, um, claims preparation costs, any other costs that are noted here will be covered um, at no additional costs. These are our standard benefits to our cover. Okay. So our underwriting criteria, um, we require a um, proposal form, fully completed proposal form. And these are some of the aspects that we generally look at when we underwriting. We need the name of the practice. So all the um, entities, including subsidiaries that need to be covered under our policy, we need them to be disclosed um, on, our, on the proposal form because you don't want to you know, miss a branch um, that the client might have or a subsidiary that they, they might need covered under this policy. Um, we also um, look at where they are domiciled. Again, we are a South African insurer, therefore um, all um, companies um, domiciled in South Africa, we would cover. Anyone domiciled outside, we do prefer that they obtain local, um, local cover where they are domiciled because of those um, local regulations in those various countries. We look at, which is very important, we look at um, qualification and experience. Again, we are covering professionals. Therefore, we do look at what qualification and experience they might have um, in the field. I do see that there is a hand up. Um, so there are a few questions, but I think we'll save questions for after. Okay, no problem. We'll look at questions after. Um, we also look at the regulatory body that they uh, might belong to. This is 
is very important to us because this gives us an idea that um, the client is is um, adhering to the rules and regulation of the industry and they are up to um to par as to what um the regulatory industry you know um has stipulated in that certain sector so this for us we do look at it and it does give us some sort of comfort with the risk because that shows us that the client is um you know up to par with what the regulatory body has stipulated fees declaration very important for us as we do rate pi um, on the declared fees or the professional fees that have been earned we do believe that once um, a client has paid the professional some sort of fee that's where the claims may emanate and therefore um, we do look at um, fees declared and that's how we rate our cover we also look at how um, work is subconsulted um, because um, if they do a uh, subconsult higher than 50% um, of their work, that changes the risk profile completely because we haven't really vetted the consultants that they're subcontracting to. Um, therefore, that makes the risk completely different to us. Uh, and we would probably would want to look at um, who they subconsult to. Do they make sure that these um, subconsultant companies carry their own PI? Do they retain um, rights of recourse from these subconsulted companies so that in the event that the subcontractor does make a mistake, we are able to then um, enforce rights of recourse against them. So that's also very important for us when we are underwriting. The work split, um, particularly in industries such as your accounting um, space and your engineer space, where they don't only do one set of work. For example, an accountant could be an auditor and they could be auditing financial institutions, which changes the This profile as well and engineers. So we always ask for the work split so that we can understand um, where the, the high exposure lies in terms of the activities. And that's why you'll see all our proposal forms will ask for a percentage split of work in that sector or in that industry. Um, we also do look at quality and risk management, very important because we do need to understand um, how the, the, the professional runs their business, what risk mitigation factors are in place, what processes and procedures do they follow, and what checks and balances are in place so that we ensure that we are comfortable that the way that they conduct their business is in line with how we want to underwrite and accept the risk. Claims history or notification, very important as well, given that our policies are on a claims made basis. So we need to know at the start of the, at the inception of the policy that um, they've had no claims or that they've notified us of any matters that they might be aware of at the time of completion of proposal form or at the time of us incepting the policy. So this is very, um, um, important. We also do want, you know, brokers to assist us with indicating what the, the, the limits that they would want and the deductibles that they might require. So this is also, um, there's a section on the proposal form on this. If that can be completed, it makes our lives a bit easy on that. So um, what are some of the exclusions or what's not covered? So we've got um, a long list of exclusions which are standard in the market um, and some which are our treaty exclusion. But in, in, in general, um, any um, communicable diseases will not be covered. Cyber losses, we've got a cyber product that we offer to our clients. So we do have an absolute cyber loss exclusion under our policy. We don't cover any DNO um, losses because we do have a DNO product. Fines, Penalties, punitive damages excluded by our treaties. Um, in any insolvency from the insured, we will not be picking up insolvency losses. Investment advice, investment performance, you'll see that these are always um, on our policy wording or on our schedules because we don't cover um, financial advice or investment advice, which is generally provided by um, your financial advisors, that can be covered under a financial institution's PI. So these losses are specific to an FIPI policy and not so much under our commercial PI policy. 
So these ones will always be excluded. And um, territorial limits, um, our territorial limits currently are worldwide, excluding North America. And um, you see that, so what we mean there is that the insured can undertake work anywhere else in the world, except um, in the um, in, in USA or Canada or North America in this instance. So we are very specific um, with our territorial limits. And then any prior claims or any circumstances um, notified as well as um, any North American claims again. So specific and additional exclusion may be found under our schedules and um, that's always um, available to the broker. But if there's any exclusion that you um, you might not be sure of, please let us know and we'll um, be happy to chat to you about that exclusion. Are there any questions so far or must I just carry on? Lisa, up to you. We have two questions. Okay, let's let's do a question and then let's carry on with the last slide. So Karen Fels, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, has said, um, please can you expand a bit on the indirect costs of coverage? Okay. That was on the few steps. So the indirect would be the consequential losses. So in most cases, you'll find that. For example, an engineer would design um, a structure and the structure will be um, constructed and they'll be supervising and monitoring and something happens on site that causes a loss to someone else other than the third party. That would be regarded as an indirect loss or a consequential loss. So it's still caused by the, you know, the direct loss, but then it's affecting someone else other than the third party that the, the, the insured has contracted with. So that is what we classify as indirect losses. Cool, Karen, I hope that helps. Um, we have Courtney White asking, will the limitation of liability clauses between the contractor and their subcontractor affect the policy response in relation to the contractor's policy? Um, so when we are looking at contractual limitation of liability, we're looking at the the insured's limitation of liability when engaging with their third party. So however they've limited it between themselves, that would be the contractual limitation of liability we are referring to. So generally you see that they're limited to two times the fees that the, the, the third party has paid them and it, it can go up to more than that. But we are looking at that contractual liability between the professional and the third party. So we have Katlejo that wants to um, ask a question verbally. Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I just have a question with regards to the territorial limits. And yes. um, with, um, for example, a lot of work being done um, virtually, what would the terms and conditions and limits be? For example, if you have a customer in... Um, the United States, but you're strictly um, domiciled in South Africa, and I'd say even your contract of agreement for um, rendering your services under South African law, uh, would there be any certain limitations um, to that sort of cover, provided that I guess all the loopholes that need to be covered and Etc. are covered by um, a South African contract because it's I'm finding it very difficult um, to find cover for clients who have expanded or want to expand um, to providing their services yes. in North America. Yeah. Thank so thanks, Katleho. So the problem there is that generally North American clients want North American jurisdiction. So you might be servicing your client from South Africa. And in most cases, I've not seen where a US client wants South African law to be applicable. In most cases, those US um, contracts they want um, USA law because it favors them and their businesses. So in most cases, you're looking at not just territorial limits, but the jurisdiction that the contract requires. So we've seen that in most cases, North American clients require North American jurisdiction, meaning that even if you're servicing them virtually from South Africa, judgment will probably be obtained against you in, in the North American courts, and the claim will also probably be um, disputed. Um, 
be discussed or heard within um, you know, the North American courts. So um, I've not yet seen a contract from any of the clients that have required USA um, cover um, stipulating South African law. Uh, I've not seen it, perhaps there is, but um, in those instances, what we generally say is judgment and you know the matter must be heard in South Africa for our policy to respond from any claims emanating from the, um, the USA or Canada. I hope that answers you. Thank you. Iso, um, there are a couple of questions coming in, but should we move yes. on and maybe get- Are there any questions, Christiana? Okay, so I'll move on. So we are seeing um, a trend in um, delictual claims, which would be your breach of duty of care claims. And Richard will be talking um, a lot about those. And we are also seeing claims under contracts. These are easy for us to defend because you know when there's a contract in place that stipulates the obligation between the, the professional and the third party and therefore we are able to set a basis of a claim and we are able to defend from there whereas with Whereas delictual claims where there's no contract, it's very difficult to defend because it's more so, um, you know, you said you were going to do this, but there's no contract in place that stipulates that the professional actually agreed to perform any of those duties. And so it's very, very difficult to, um, to uh, defend any breach of duty of care claims. However, we, our policy will pick these up because that would be a trigger to the policy. So our policy would cover delictual claims as well as any claims under contract. But I will then be um, sharing um, Richard's profile and Richard's slides in a minute, and he will take us through um, any of um, you know any questions that you might have in terms of limitation of liability for your client, or any um, you know questions that you might have between delictual claims and contractual claims. So as I've mentioned, our guest speaker is um, Richard Hall, who's at Court Seats, who's an attorney. Um, and I will just quickly share his slides. Please just bear with me. Okay, please just confirm if you can hear it, see we can, it. We can Thank hear you. and see, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Great, morning everybody. Uh, I, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm, I've been asked to, to talk to you predominantly about the built environment contracts uh, and the frame of reference back to, to your PI cover. Um, a lot of my comments will be, um, a lot of my comments will be universal to, to across all the professions. Um, so yeah, I think if, if we have a look then at the typical forms of built environment contracts we'd see for the various professionals. Um, if we can change slides, sorry, I don't think I've got option to change myself. I will change it. Thanks. Right, so the, the theme, um, as has been touched on already, is the importance of written contracts. It can't be stressed enough. Um, and, and obviously in your interactions with the insureds, to really make that clear to them in the context of PR discussions, I think the biggest risk uh, for, for any insured in, in the built environment or any professional is the extent of the exposure versus the cover that you've bought. And to many people, PI cover of 5 million may sound like a lot until something goes wrong. So I'm, I'm gonna share with you some pictures and insights from some of the matters and claims I've been involved in. 
uh, and you'll see the magnitude of, of the casualty claims that we do confront, and then all of a sudden 5 million cover seems really low. So the, the importance of a written agreement primarily will be on the limitation of that liability and making sure that the insureds are not going to be in a shortfall situation. So typically, all professionals in the built environment would use one of the, the standard form professional service agreements. And it should be a matter of practice for those larger nationals, they may be following ISO systems, uh, quality assurance systems that require them to have written agreements. But it's, it's not unfortunately um, too, too uh, much of a surprise that even for some of the nationals, they will take on work without written agreements being in place. The most common forms across uh, and built environment would cover engineers, architects, quantity surveyors, project managers. Um, the most common form across the board is PROXA. So that's the Professional Consultant Services Agreement Committee. That, that is a body um, represented by almost all of the built environments uh, have input into the form of those agreements. SACAP is the South African Council for Architectural Profession. They have a standard form agreement. SIA is the South African Institute of Architects. They also have a standard form agreement. Consulting engineers have their own short form agreement that they recommend. And then we see in NEC suite of agreements and in the FIDIC suite, they each have their own professional services uh, standard agreements. They all have schedules attached to them that are completed and all of them will touch on, uh, if we can shift to the next slide, the, the most important terms we'd be looking for in these standard form agreements. So most importantly, they would define the scope of work that the professional's undertaking, what specific services are required. Without any kind of written agreement, we see major disputes as to what an engineer or what a project manager's function was and were they responsible to do supervision work during construction, for example. So an agreement that sets out the scope makes our life a little easier when we have to deal with the claim. We're able to diagnose what at least they were responsible for. Also, very importantly, the fee and the payment obligations. Um, you would think that would be of major concern to, to most insureds, but they typically prepare to take on the appointment and hope for the best. You will also get uh, in, in PR policies a fee recovery extension, uh, which you really should be trying to take for your insureds as far as possible. It's a really useful tool because where, where there is a dispute and a client is not paying fees, you can rest assured that most clients will then raise performance of the professionals as a reason not to make payment of fees. So those two concepts are really intertwined. It often triggers a PR claim simply because the, the client makes allegations of, of negligence or non-performance in order to avoid paying. So if you've got a fee recovery extension, then the insured can have the costs involved in that litigation on the fee recovery potentially also covered alongside the, the PI uh, component. It also fixes things like the duration of the appointment, um, when it ends. Uh, it deals importantly with issues around the termination, rights of uh, uh, payment, when payment must be made um, and the ability to get paid irrespective of a dispute. Um, very importantly, it will deal with liability issues, liabilities as we've touched on for subconsultants, liabilities um, or limitation of a liability, which is very important. Virtually all of the standard form agreements contain a limitation of liability it's commonly twice the professional fee. 
um, which is important to bear in mind when you are considering the extent of cover that an insured may need. And I'm going to touch a little bit later on project policies, single project cover versus annual cover. And where an insured is working on a large project, it really does need thought around whether a separate policy should be in place. Um, and also time periods, limitation on time periods. Uh, when does prescription start running? Three years from when? Uh, you know, what insurers don't want is a long tail on all of these claims. So they would be looking really to the insurers to set up these limitations in their engagement agreements. Also, importantly, responsibility for insurance. Um, typically, at the time of contracting, no one really thinks too hard about the, the insurance obligations. And as you've heard, this is obviously a, a PI focus, but general liability claims and third party liability uh, is also something that, that needs to be considered as to whether there is an extension around that. I've touched on the subcontracting that will deal with arrangements and limitations between um, the, the sub consultants working on a project uh, and also dispute resolution clauses that may result in arbitration proceedings um, as opposed to courts. So if we can change slide, um, I just wanted to touch then on risk management or some mitigation issues. What, what can insureds do and, and what can you be talking to insureds to do to manage their risk and keep their exposure low? I mean, I think number one risk problem is, is where the undefined scope of service. So a client has an expectation that a professional is going to be doing work that they actually are not hired to do or haven't charged a fee for. And that, and that we see a lot in the architect space as an example. An architect does a design, uh, the client appoints a builder, and before you know it, there's an issue with the builder and the client says to the architect, well, you, you should have been project managing, you should have been supervising the, the builder's work. So I, I would say at least 60% of claims against architects come from additional services, maybe not relating to pure design work. So it's very important in the contract at the outset to define who's doing what and what responsibility uh, is being attached to the service. Undefined fees, uh, again, an issue um, you've heard from an underwriting point of view, the importance around fees. Uh, at a practical level, virtually, uh, all of our disasters emanate from heavily discounted fees. And, and that stands to reason when you understand that, a, that a, a professional who is having to discount their fee structure um, too robustly is going to have to cut corners in terms of the amount of resources allocated to a project. Uh, and particularly when you get to the supervision levels of a project, Heavily discounted fees is a real red flag. The, the resources that are allocated to a project is another big risk mitigation. The insured's resources, but importantly, the project's resources. So how experienced is the professional team that's working on the project? How experienced is the client? Um, are there enough professionals uh, or is your insured the only one working on the project by himself and having to, to be a bit of a jack of all trades? That's a real risk issue. Um, and, and obviously insurance and the obligation to insure. And all too often people make a, a wild leap of assumptions about who's going to take out the policy of insurance um, and, and who's covered by that policy. So in a, in a PI context, the client or employer doesn't have any cover. So uh, it, it, it really doesn't help an employer to, to assume that the project risks will be covered by, by an insured or consultant's PI cover. I mean, there's 
contract works risk, uh, general liability risk, third party damage claims, and then obviously the professional negligence component, which is only one component of all the insurances potentially needed in the built environment. Um, I just wanted to touch also just on some general risks in, in the built environment um, to be aware of and, and for you to potentially discuss with some of your insurers. Um, the, the one is the general trend we see on, on reduction in project budget. So everybody's trying to build more for less. Uh, that means designs have to be e super economic. People are potentially cutting corners on fees, the degree of supervision on site, uh, et cetera, which is all adding to the risk. And, and in most cases, the professionals sit carrying that risk for the non-performance of others on the project. Um, I've touched on the overzealous tendering or procurement issues. To get work nowadays, you've got to come in uh, at way below your, your professional fee tariff structures. And that means, again, profits are down, projects are not making money, uh, and therefore professionals may not be allocating enough resources. Um, it's pretty notorious that there's a, a, a decline in professional standards across the boards, um, training, supervision, mentoring, um, an exodus of skills across the professional service sectors. And, and I've, I've, I've raised technology as an issue. Um, in an engineering context, I can think of a few uh, eras where, where young engineers are over-dependent perhaps on technology simply inputting data into the ProCon design program and not thinking about the result. So we're getting design errors made by just wrong inputs in, into, into technology and the human element perhaps not doing an independent check. So technology is good, it's a risk mitigation strategy, but if you're over dependent on it, it's a potential risk, I think. Um, Next slide for me, thanks. Uh, just a few of the other risk issues, um, COVID, home office work environment, uh, integration amongst professionals is definitely compromised in that environment. Um, and then the financial reduction out of COVID, uh, professionals in the built environment have really been struggling. So their risk management um, it perhaps is a little decreased internally, that's seeing certainly a risk. And I think underwriters are looking at that. You guys probably have all experienced some pressure on, on premiums um, arising out of uh, post-COVID resurgence. I've touched a little bit on the mismatch of professional skills to work taken on. We see architects trying to do project management. We're seeing um, scope creep from the professions. And then uh, an increase in, in claims against architects, PR, particularly arising from their principal agent role and, and confusing that with project management. So that's a, that's a risk. I think architects really look, need to look at increasing cover wherever they can because of that. And then um, single projects and single projects P, PR. I think uh, for many of your insureds, they'd be running on annual policies and, and hope that looking at previous turnover, they've got sufficient cover. I think you need to really warn all of them that where they may have exposure on some larger projects, that single project cover, uh, which may include themselves and consultants, joint ventures, uh, they will lend themselves to, uh, to that kind of, of cover or, or project specific PR. So that's something definitely to, to talk to, to the insureds around. Um, I just want to touch briefly before I, I, I look at a couple of pictures and, and they will tell the story of, of why the value of PI is so important. Um, and 
the extensions around defense costs and statutory investigations. So in the, these kinds of construction casualties I'll, I'll deal with, the investigation costs of professionals, of material testing, um, the Department of Labor investigations and, and statutory investigations, extra internal professional investigations, that becomes really expensive. Um, Carmeny will tell you we we're working on a matter now, which is a, an arbitration dispute with uh, uh, professionals who rendered architectural and engineering services on a large housing project, and they've got five million cover, and the projection costs of the arbitration exceed five million. It's set down for six weeks. The arbitrator's fees alone would be approximately a million rand. Uh, and an arbitration of that magnitude can easily cost between five and 10 million. And if there's only 5 million cover, then that cover is, is gone on legal costs, excluding um, the project value. You know, and that project value uh, in, in construction cost was about one and a half billion rand. So, you know, clearly the insured was not cognizant of the extent of cover and really for a project like that should have looked to extend um, extend their scope. So we'll see now, I'm just gonna take you through a few interesting uh, little case studies. So uh, this picture and we can scroll through just quickly was a shopping center um, in Tongat that collapsed. There was, a, there was a statutory investigation the developer had no insurance, the contractor had no insurance, and the only insured in this investigation was, uh, was an engineer who had PI cover, which fortunately provided indemnity for his investigation and defense costs. Um, and, and ultimately, I think he was exonerated through those hearings and was able to successfully defend any claims uh, that were made. So if we just scroll through the, the photos there, I mean, this was a, a, a collapse the size of a rugby field. Um, sadly, people did, uh, were killed. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, that, just to finish that thought, so there, a PI would have provided cover potentially for all of the employer losses for the potential costs of the reconstruction of the shopping center, as I say, as well as all of the statutory investigation defense costs. So next slide is, um, was a, a temporary works collapse over the M1 in Johannesburg. Um, the support work on a bridge just before uh, the concrete was cast, collapsed one afternoon just before rush hour traffic. There were a number of fatalities. It hit the media headlines, had a massive impact on the contracting companies and designers that were involved reputationally um, to share prices, et cetera. And the investigation started almost immediately, Department of Labor convened a formal inquiry. Um, everybody who was involved in the project was in the inquiry. The inquiry ran for nearly a year in duration, in excess of six weeks hearing, a hugely complicated investigation involving engineers from all over the world that modeled the structure to try and work out what had caused the collapse and who might be accountable. So the, the statutory defense costs collectively in that room, I would say conservatively were more than a hundred million. Uh, and that's without the third party claims, loss of support, dependent claims, et cetera. Uh, and obviously equipment and other losses were, were considerable. All right, next, next one. Um, this was a, a, a chemical store, uh, a tilt-up system of construction, and 
as the panels were being lifted into place with the crane and the roof sections being lowered down, the system collapsed um, outwards. Unfortunately, again, loss of life, uh, loss of equipment, uh, as you can see. Um, and, and generally, where there's a loss of life incident, you can expect there to be a full investigation by Department of Labor. This, again, was a statutory inquiry. Um, which again results in you having to, to employ independent experts, consulting engineers, structural experts, concrete experts, analyze materials for materials failure, and the cost can be quite significant. Uh, yeah, I think there is, yeah, so there's just an idea of the extent of this kind of structure, the cleanup costs, all of those consequential losses that uh, people have to pick up. Um, the next uh, couple of slides, um, if we go, is is flood damage um, to to projects. Um, I just want to, yeah, we can scroll through that. That was a hydroelectric scheme where there were design issues that uh, came into question on a massive flood in Uganda um, that ran into millions and millions of dollars. And again, PI was triggered by the design engineers uh, potentially being responsible for the losses and extent of the damages. Um, so Willie, I see a, a question just around the potential claims on the flood damage. So I've, I've put up a couple of pictures um, because the, the claims here are, are by number some of the highest ever for flood damage. And um, the extent of the structural damage in Amshloti is hard to comprehend. For those of you who've, who may have seen it in person, the pictures don't do it justice. Um, the extent of the undermining all the way down through Amshloti and the devastation to hundreds of homes and sectional title units here. Um, yeah, so there were in fact two separate flood incidents in April and uh, to boot, we had excessive rains in KZN again in May, by which point the ground was totally saturated and virtually there was zero attenuation anywhere. So, um, yeah, that it poses interesting liability questions, general liability, as well as professional liability um, around stormwater design, stormwater control measures. Um, and, and that would certainly trigger PI claims and general liability claims. So, yeah, I think just. Just to summarize, um, Richard, for me, yeah, sure. Can I quickly just ask a question on around sure. these flood um, claims? Do you think um, you know the geotechnical reports might be you know called into you know investigation for any of these um, flood claims? And also, do you think we will start to see some land surveying claims as well from these um, flood claims? Yes, I think um, there's there's potential for those claims. I would say land surveyors, uh, not generally not. Um, you know, they're primarily undertaking setting out work uh, levels, et cetera. So they they certainly need to have PI, but I, I don't think the the flooding incidents and the damage in Amshloti is going to trigger land surveyor liability. I think there is potential for geotechnical engineering liability. Um, you know, they study soil, soil conditions um, and support. We, you see in a lot of these photos, and I think we've seen them in some of the dramatic pictures where you, you see the piling and support work visible where the sand and soil have collapsed. It's been undermined from the bottom. Um, you know, and there may be some support claims that arise from that. 
as I've learned, um, the, the experts probably primarily involved in this investigation would be hydrologists who study uh, the, the effect of water on the geotech conditions and water flow and underground water flows and whether the designs have been adequate to deal with that. I think one of the things that um, we've seen in Amshloti is just the absence of stormwater controls, um, which is primarily a, a municipality function. Uh, they generally have to design stormwater controls on all development, uh, and they should have stormwater measures on, on roads um, and discharge that, that hits the public roads. So in an urban environment, just about all properties are discharging some stormwater um, onto public roads. And the data on these rainfalls is it looks somewhere in the range of one to in a 200 year flood event. So typically the city asks people to design stormwater controls at one in 50. So a storm that you would expect once every 50 years. So it's not intended to be able to cope with uh, that kind of flood event that, that happens that infrequently. And it's calling into question climate control, climate change, you know, and, and controls around climate change and whether it's appropriate now to be designing for that kind of data. So, yeah, there's going to be lots of interesting debate. The city in Durban is, is re-looking at their their design criteria around stormwater, and, and they have already instructed and contracted with contractors to start remedial works, installing stormwater controls around the Amshloti area um, and looking to beef those up. Um, I had a, a series of conclusions um, just to, to touch on, and, and really a, the most important summary is the absence of written agreements is, is going to pose an enormous risk to your insured. So really, uh, underwriters and I have this debate often whether there should be any kind of exclusion in PR where in the absence of written agreements that it may, it may introduce a reduction in cover or an additional excess. Um, and I think that that is possibly something that you can expect from the market in time. So the insured should really be pushing the, to ensure they've got written agreements um, in place. It, as you've heard, it makes it really difficult for insurers to defend when there's no contract in place. Uh, and the net result for your insurers is, is that insurers are going to pay more claims. They, that's going to affect loss ratios the insured's risk profiles, and then premiums, for sure. So that's something really to emphasize. I think there may be some questions now, so I'm happy to try and respond to those. Hi, Richard. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions. So um, in relation to the floods, Nalene is asking, what happens if the flooding fall exceeds what would be considered within the norm of that area? Yeah, thanks. That's an interesting liability question. Uh, yeah. And I think something we're gonna have to we're gonna have to debate probably quite vigorously. We can expect the claims they've started rolling in. Um certainly uh, if from a design point of view, if you were looking at the responsibility of, a, of an engineer involved in stormwater management system design, and they complied with the one in 50 storm requirement on design, it would be very difficult to say they were negligent if you then had a one in 200 year event. The answer would be, but I've designed to, to that requirement and it's, it's not professionally negligent of me. I've and therefore I don't attract that liability. So that's something that would definitely be raised by, by PR policy. Whether that's something that a general liability policy can raise that there, there are more interesting nuanced questions there. 
Right. Um, so I think maybe in relation to that, I am jumping around the questions, just trying to connect mm -hmm. them all. Um, yeah. We have Tamsanka that has asked, when making reference to negligence, what is the difference between gross negligence and negligence? And do we, South African law, gravitate on negligence? Yeah, so um, a lot of contracts will exclude liability for gross negligence. Um, you can do that. Uh, it's an interesting question in our law whether you can even exclude liability for negligence at all. Uh, and, and I think the, the present academic thinking is that would be contrary to public policy to even try. So, so the law does grapple with that. The case law um, does distinguish between gross negligence, which is almost a reckless disregard bordering almost on intent, whereas the test for negligence is no reasonable architect or no reasonable professional would have would have done that. Um, so you, you're testing it by a slightly lesser standard for ordinary negligence. Right, Tamsanka, I hope that answers your question. Um, we have one from Lucille. She is saying, hi, what about liability against the council or municipality due to the lack of maintenance? Obviously, maintenance is not an insured peril, but negligence on the council side. Yeah, I think um, that's something insurers are probably going to have to grapple with. Uh, the homeowners may potentially have claims against the municipality if they have not um, adequately ensured that the stormwater, I mean, it, to take it back a section, roads are the biggest stormwater catchment area. It's a hard surface, it's impermeable, nothing attenuates off a road. So as soon as you build a road, you, you're creating a, a significant amount of rainwater runoff, which requires the, in, the installation of stormwater controls, manholes, underground stormwater management systems. And I think that where we're seeing damage on roads and adjacent properties, it's often connected to the stormwater systems. The city has put out quite a lot of material from its experts. It's, it's actually been quite transparent, saying that their stormwater management systems haven't been maintained. They've got a lot of um, plant growth and and blockages that the, that they haven't anticipated, so their stormwater systems haven't functioned at hundred percent. So I think that there is there there are claims. I mean, we know of of uh, in our city's policy in Durban, particularly the potholes. If they're not maintaining the road and you you hit a pothole and you damage your tire they're liable for that loss. You know, the, the, their responsibility is maintenance. So, so I think that there is, there is that potential liability on their part. Um, I know, I think we're running out of time. We've got about a minute. So maybe one question from the um, claims team perspective. Um, we see many employers refusing to award contracts unless indemnities and contractual limitations are removed from contracts. What would be an appropriate way for the insured to handle this situation? Yeah, that is a good point. And, and, and some clients won't accept a limitation of liability. So to my mind, that should trigger a discussion then about a project policy, a project specific policy, rather than relying on a, an annual policy, which has probably got lower limits and, and making sure then that the client accepts that shared responsibility to the, to the cost of it. So my, my suggestion for those insureds is to try and push that back to the client and say, well, then we need to take a large project policy and, and that's going to increase the costs potentially. Uh, so you need to contribute to that. Right. Um, Richard, we have two more questions. I don't know if you have time to squeeze. I have the time if everyone is, uh, is still happy to stay on. 
Cool. So um, I think Jean and Bazzi will do your questions. Um, Bazzi is saying, am I correct to state fee recovery? Sorry, this is more for um, our underwriters. Am I correct to state fee recovery will only trigger when there is a potential claim? So fee recovery generally is not a um, debt recovery tool. So we're not trying to assist the insured to, in recovering that fee. However, if there is a counterclaim from the third party, that's when um, we start then um, you know, proceedings in that. So fee recovery is generally based on a counterclaim from the third party. I don't know, Richard, do you want to add to that if you've seen any fee recovery claims? Yeah, um, that that is spot on. So they 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 are triggered when there's the allegation, mm -hmm. usually in a counterclaim. So the insured typically uh, sues for payment of fees, and then the allegation is made, which then triggers the policy response and coverage. Then, because now the issue is, are the fees being incurred for the fee claim, or are they being incurred in the defence cost? And yes. and really, that's when the policy responds and says, well, we'll cover it all. Thank cool. you. Um, Jean is saying, kindly touch on JVs where consultants pool skills, but separate cover was affected and not in the name of the JV. What happens if the services of one of the partners are found wanting, but the client holds the JV liable? Um, yeah, that's a that's a complex situation, and I think um. It's one of the reasons why where you're working in a consortium or a grouping like that, single cover is better for everyone. Otherwise, you've got all the cross liabilities that arise. So the client's entitled to hold the JV as a single partnership entity liable, and they can make a claim against the JV. But then you've got to work out what was the cause of that possible liability and who has that responsibility. So what it's going to do is potentially pit all the members of the JV together um, arguing about who's who, who carried that risk, mm -hmm. which is all, yeah, it's going to make the litigation extremely complicated. Um, our policy, just to add, our policy does extend to cover joint ventures. We cover the insured's participation in the joint venture, and um, they generally, severally, and jointly um, liable in a claim, and therefore we will pay um, our insured's portion in that um, claim. So we do extend to cover JVs as well. Cool, guys. Um, I think uh, Stuart, Greg, and Deborah, um, your questions are mainly for our underwriters. So um, I'll bug Fiesel with your questions. I'm sure she won't mind sending you an email with yes, the answers okay. after. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Fiesel, if you want to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana. Thanks, Richard, um, for joining us. Thanks to the claims team as well for um, organizing this. Um, we truly appreciate you. And thanks to all our brokers for joining us. Um, we hope it was informative for you. And um, to the next one, we hope to see you to the, at, um, at the next one. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.